Hello, I'm Dr. Basil Considine. I'm here from the ACU Online Writing Center, and today we're going to talk about infographics in APA style. Now, if you're new to the Writing Center, we work with students through a variety of settings, including through webinars such as this, through appointments where you come to us with questions and or requests for feedback, and also through developing a variety of different resources. This is one where students such as yourselves wrote us and said that they wanted to have a webinar on how to create infographics. So that's what we're going to do today. And uh, let's just dive right in today. You'll see me using the APA course paper template later when we get to how to format material in APA style. But for now, let's look at what our plan is. We'll talk a little bit about why to use an infographic, how to create one using Word, how to create one using Excel, and how however you've created it, how to format the infographic in APA style. All right, let's look at that first one. So why use an infographic? What is the core purpose? What is the motivating reason? Well, in the context of our academic programs, that's mostly going to be to convey complicated data in a simple and accessible visual format. Now, if you are, say, pursuing a goal of becoming a social media influencer or doing social media marketing, you may be specifically trying to craft content that is engaging and designed to go viral and be greatly shared, in which case you might be looking at some additional things like the particular dimensions used in Instagram or something of that ilk. We're not going to delve into those because those are separate from the core purpose of why you would create an infographic to begin with. Now, Besides that, you might be looking to create something that's a tangible point of reference, something that you can refer back to, which is especially helpful if you're diagramming a process. Create easily extractable content. So this does go in the direction of if you have things that you might want to go viral or share on social media, but it also pertains to things if you are doing research that you're hoping to get press coverage to create things that a newspaper, for example, could easily extract and run as part of an article. So what makes an ideal infographic? Well, some of the qualities are accessible, so it should be easy to read, uh, clear. It should cement the understanding of the material. People should not look at it and, and uh, go away with more questions than answers. It should be making sense of things. And one of the ways to do that is to keep the infographic and the material in it reasonably concise. You could always create more than one graphic to or create a more detailed graphic to explain some part of a process. But start with it being something where the reader can look at it and say, ah, I see what's going on. Eye-catching is ideal, but it doesn't have to be visually flashy to communicate something clearly. So here's an example of a somewhat more complicated infographic. It's more complicated in terms of visual structure. We have uh, different palettes on the left and right hand side. Uh, I'm just going to scroll up a little bit so you can see my screen here. You see the top of that. Scroll down, you can see the, the bottom of that. So there, there's a lot going on here. So this is an infographic about infographics. And uh, you see that although it's initially very busy, uh, because there's something approaching a mirror image, going on between the left and right hand side. So it's actually, by contrasting these, it takes that complex set of information and makes it more clear because we've sorted into, okay, uh, written is one paradigm versus illustrated on the right. Um, we have the, the text, oh, your audience can interpret it versus your audience can experience it. And you can see how the common text and your audience can is in the same size, the same shape, a, so that really draws our attention to the key differences, maybe interpret versus experience. And then you can see the outcomes. Uh, the, you know, the way this is done is kind of fun. It's not all square tables or something. It has a sense of dynamicism because things aren't quite squared off. Uh, it's talking about how this outcome, how concepts open to misinterpretation is not squarely above disengaging and that. So that just adds a little bit of 
visual interest to it and you're, it kind of makes your eye flip from one place to another as you're reading through it. Uh, I've included uh, the note that you would have under this if you were incorporating this infographic into a paper written in APA style. You can see that the note says adapted from, meaning it's taken from. Um, and adapted can be as simple as changing the context, but either way, credit the original author from which this is derived, the year of publication, in this case the web URL, and then the copyright notice. Now the copyright notice is almost always going to be the same year of the publication, and whether it's the author, in this case in Citro, uh, holding the copyright, or whether it's, say, the journal or a university, that'll depend on the source. And so if you're repackaging content or information from a university, sorry, from a peer-reviewed journal article, check what the journal article website says about who claims a copyright. If you have a physical copy of the journal, that's usually going to be at the front. All right. So let's talk about how to create infographics using Microsoft Word. And you could go look at for different articles using the article discovery process outlined here. But uh, I think we can talk our way through this. So here in Microsoft Word, I have a series of menus here on the ribbon. If I go to insert, we have a number of different options here. Shapes, OK, I just want to draw things. Icons, similar idea. You want to insert some sort of visual in there. 3D models, same thing. What we're looking for is something like smart art or a chart. So the chart, if we have some sort of data that's in a readable format, usually meeting a table, we can use that to create graphics. We'll talk more about that when we get to Excel. Right now, let's use the smart art tool here. And you can see that it divides into different types of arrangements. And these aren't the only ones possible, but these are kind of the archetypes here. And let's say that we're going to be describing a process here. And you can look at it and see a couple of visual examples. Some of them have key differences like, oh, there's this is a linear process going from one to the other. Some things, perhaps, it will have forks that are available, different steps or branches. Uh, but if it's something that's going around and repeating cycle, will we see things here uh, to show different relationships between things? And uh, you know, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and look at the matrix example. So matrix is good for when you're showing things that don't, strictly speaking, overlap, but where there are quadrants, where there are um, common properties that are shared by some things according to what's in a row, what's in a column. So let's go ahead and let's take this titled matrix here. And you can see we've got our four zones and our central thing. So let's say that we are working with personality types, and there are many different systems for personality types, but let's go with introvert for our And now there's a question, what's the central feat here? And you can see as I've typed things, it's automatically adjusted the size. And for that matter, it's sorted things into this list format here so I can easily make changes here. And it's even suggesting some different visual designs here. So let's say I decide that I want to have uh, this one here. You can see it was given us a little more shading, so it gives it some visual pop. But I can also go ahead and choose between some of these options that are available here and see what that looks like. 
So maybe I think, well, uh, actually, I wish I tried that one. You can see how it reformats that. Now, it doesn't have that central element anymore, so that shifts away from the center, and we can move these. But like, okay, that is actually not what I ha had in mind. Um, I want to have personality types be the title of the graphic. So something I need to do here is to add some space here. Figure, and we call it a figure. Yeah, infographic is a more specific type of figure. Figure 1, personality types. And now I need to separate these. And in fact, I'm going to move these to a different level. So each has its own space. And you can see how I'm using the arrow tool here to move that around. And this empty one, I'll delete. And oh, great. Now I've got that layout I'm looking for. Now, could you go in and label the columns um, on top of that? Sure. Uh, you, you can do a lot of things with the infographics, including having access to this set of menus here. You can add a text box over it. That would be insert text box. And so you can add labels like that as you see fit. Now in this case, just to give it a little bit more uh, visual continuity, I'm going to go ahead and align that center. It just looks a little bit neater. And another thing I can do is I can change the dimensions here. Say, oh, OK, I want this to be extra large. Let me move that there, move that there. And let's zoom out a little bit. And you can see I now have my figure here. Now, if if this is something that is wholly of my own creation, I do not need to include a note saying, here's where the information came from. Now, if it's derived from someone else's ideas, that's a good thing to include. All right, uh, so that's one way to create a simple infographic in Word. Let's say we're describing a process here to and note that the title of the figure is going in title case. Now it's time for me to insert that smart art. So let's go ahead and we're going to use a process here. Now, I think this process is going to have a lot of stages, so I'm going to pick one that has more than one. No, more than three, really. And I can click into here, and you, or you can click into this part and just type step one. Now, the, for the purposes of our illustration here, the exact details for what go into these aren't so much as important as having the clear sense of, oh, yes, this leads for that. And so we have both the arrows, and in this case, numbering it as step one, step two, step three, etc. 
Now, suppose that I say, well, this, it, I thought it was going to be just a workflow, but I'm actually describing a cycle. So one thing you can do is to look at this and see, okay, what can I change? Now, for typing in different things, just go ahead and use this little triangle here. It will give you a menu where you can select those, and you can perhaps rearrange the hierarchy. Now, oftentimes people will start fiddling around and they'll say, you know, th these changes, it's not quite what I'm looking for. I realize I want a different selection here. So it's fine. So if you right click on the background of your smart art, uh, control click if you're on a Mac, and if you select format object, that will give you some choices here. But what we really want here is to look at what this is, like the layout. Is it laid out as a list? Is it laid out as a process? If so, what type? So format object here is about changing the visual aspects, like, oh, the colors, perhaps some details of shadows or shading. And you know, can do that, but that it that's very much cosmetic as opposed to, let's say, okay, um, actually I am envisioning this now as a cycle. So I select change layout cycle, and then let's say I pick this one here, a continuous cycle. Now I have a number of options for what I can do here. Uh, one of which I can still rearrange and have sub steps if I want. I though I'd probably label it one uh, A, one B, something like that. Uh, but this gives me a different way of looking at it, and I might say, okay, all right, uh, I do want it to be a cycle, but I have a different level of things in mind. In particular, I want to have the central element, the basic cycle here. Now, when I select this here, you'll notice that I end up with just one thing showing here. And over here, the numbers two through six are X'd out. So that's telling me that those are not something that this kind of model uses. There should be one hierarchical thing at top and then a bunch of sub things. So what am I gonna call this? Well, uh, I'll call this the process cycle. And I'm going to go ahead and I need to rearrange things. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to make that my number one, my top. And everything else, I'm going to go ahead and make a sub step here. So it's circling that. Now, if you're curious, I can even make sub things of that. So this is how you can take the the infographic from the basic conception to adding more complex elements. Now, I can go ahead and take some of these things, click on them individually or a group. Uh, if you want to select more than one, hold uh, down Alt if you're on a PC or Command if on a Mac when you click. And then when you right click or control click to get the menu to do something like formatting the shape, I can go ahead and recolor several at the same time like that and so you can use things like this to give extra visual pop here now there are a number of different options especially when we're creating it about themes and designs and if you see up here there's a smart design thing here so you can also preview the different elements there um, so look at that and say, no, that's actually not how it's working. It's going round and round, so I want to go back. But I can pull from different layouts here. Again, if you're looking for that special visual pop for a presentation or something that's being circulated online, and there's even a change to colors where you have different schemes there. Now, I personally don't like this color scheme. I find it distracting, so I'm going to look around and say, okay, change colors. Let's go ahead with... this game. I'm like, ah, I don't like it. Well, you can go back to the original. It was going to reset the shape. Reset graphic. See, that turns back to the plane thing. So I can now go in 
add whatever I want. It's like, okay, well, uh, let's go ahead and, uh, you know what, I like green. But I further want to modify that. Let's make it look a little bit more three-dimensional. Maybe a little tilt. Nah, that's interfering with the readability. So here we are. I think this is a good compromise here. All right. Now, want to keep the figure label here on the same page, so I'm going to insert a page break. Insert, page break. And so now this starts on a new page. Great. Now, in general, it's a good idea to have your graphic fill the width for maximum readability. If it's really something that's small and it, you're not getting a lot, okay, but here by adjusting the proportions, make sure that that text is easy to read. Okay, all right, so let's talk about Excel now. So now, in order to create an infographic in Excel, we're going to need some data. And here, I've taken a journal article that I found through the ERIC Educational Database that has a table with some numerical data here. So we've got school enrollment, we've got the eligibility for free or reduced price lunch, and a few other things here. And when you're creating a graphic from data like this, it's important to keep in mind that you're usually not trying to capture the whole table. Because the table, if you're looking for all the data, that's what it's doing already. But in this case, there is a subset of the data that we want to highlight in a particular infographic or part of an infographic. So let's say we want to capture that school enrollment data here. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and create a file in Excel. So as you can see here, I've transcribed the key data from the table. And now there's the question of, well, what can I do with it? And so that's going to hinge on what data I want to be working with here. So if I select, for example, this area here, and I go to insert, I have an option slot here for different charts. So if I just have this selected here and I go to recommended charts, we will try and make an educated guess at how you might want to use this. In this case, if I'm showing the three, it's going to probably be a proportional thing. And why would I use this? Well, to indicate that there's roughly the same proportion. Now, depending on uh, the type of chart, this will show the differences or the similarities is stronger than others. So for example, clustered bar, you can see that this is cut off, so it's starting 520, and we just see those edge differences. Because as you note know from this one here, it's hard to see the difference that far out. Now, if this is not one that uh, appeals to you, well, you also have a selection of options here. So, for example, I might decide that I want to use a scatter plot. See, we've got these data points there. That's not actually really helpful to me. So. I'm not, not going to use that, but you can try them out really easily. So again, going here, see, okay, you know what? What I want is a, what I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to go with some columns here. And I like it to have a little bit of visual uh, flair. So I'm going to go ahead and use the 3D version here, 3D clustered bar. Now, if I want to change these options, I say I don't want it to start there. I can right click or control click if you're on a Mac and go to format access and see, oh, uh, where is this going to start? Well, it's starting with 520 now, I can make that start at zero if I really want. Now, let's see what happens when I do that. And I'm just gonna click anywhere other than this menu you can see that this chart has been automatically updated, so it's now starting at zero. And I can, again, right-click on it and change the, cart, the chart type. I say, oh, you know what? I want just those plain old vertical ones. 
And you see it's kept that change where I made to make it the start at zero. Now I can still visually reformat this and you can see that there's this option here to play with some of the options like, uh, oh, less of a gap, more of a gap. Colors. Let's go with, uh, I want to make this the mall orange. Or perhaps I'm going to take this one here in the middle. And if you use command click on a Mac or control click on a PC, you can select an individual column and color it differently, should you so desire. So something to keep in mind is that in APA style, you'll be giving the name of the, the chart, the figure as they'll call it in APA style, you'll be giving that uh, separately from the image itself. So what we want to do is make sure that your axes are labeled correctly. So school A, school B, school C, that's pretty obvious. But it's not obvious here what is being shown here. And so we need to add a label here. So how might we do this? Well, we could go to Format Access. And you see that there's um, not a whole lot available there. Um, that's, so what are we looking for? Well, that's about formatting the text. We need to put the text in first. So going back to here. What are our options here? Well, within that, we can select this axis here, select the numbers there. And what can we do? Well, turns out there's a reason we're not seeing it because this is only allowing us to format what's already been created. So what we need to do is add a new element here. Now, you can see that this is just adding chart overall, but we have a number of options here under chart design. These are just visual shortcuts, but add chart elements. So again, I said, to add something that's not there already. So if we add an axis label, or axis title, we're looking for primary vertical. School enrollment, great. And then this element here, if we want to get rid of it, we just select it and hit delete. And you can see that it's automatically resized. Now here's the fun part. We can select this chart and go to Word and just paste it in. We don't need to separately save it as a image. We can just copy and paste it in. And then, of course, we would then give it a label. Bold that part. And now, because this is data that's not coming from my study, it's coming from a published thing, I now need to credit that. Okay, now you can see that uh, this is the article in Eric, and I can grab this information here and look at uh, how I would reformat that for uh, APA style. You can even look at the article itself and see, is there any additional information that it gives me here? Uh, no page numbers. All right. No article number. All right, that's fine. We have a direct link to it though. So let's head over to here. Now at this point, we should be working in our APA course paper template. So I've copied and pasted all those figures from earlier into this. And let's go ahead and grab that reference information. Now it's not in APA style yet, but first I'll paste and then I'll select keep text only. And now I'll start rearranging. So the authors go at the beginning. The first name gets turned into an initial. Okay. 
keep the year. Now here's a time-saving thing. When you have a lot of text here that you need to change the case, there's this case tool where we can set that all to be lowercase. It certainly beats retyping that all by hand. And then our volume, the issue number will go in parentheses. And then there's no page range here. Um, and there's none on the article itself. But I want to make sure that I'm not missing something like an article number that could possibly have been missed by accident. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do a search for the journal. And I'm going to go look on the journal website to see did they assign anything here. So this was the fall 2015 issue. And we can look at this here and see, okay. No article number so far. And this is something that happens sometimes with online only uh, publications. They may not assign article numbers because it lives natively online. Now that said, I can go ahead and give a direct link there, and that's fine. It may take three lines, that's fine. This is in the reference list, it's not distracting from the rest. Uh, and then that's all we need here for acknowledging that this was used as a source there. However, for the figure itself and its information here, we need to clarify that this came from another source. Adapted from, uh, because it's been changed from going from the table to into this bar chart here. So here are the two key resources to use on APA style .apa.org. So there's an explanation of how to label and format figures and some samples to look at in case you want to look at some actual stuff here. Now, if we are looking at this figure in context, you can see that uh, this figure here, for this original figure, we've got that figure label with the text figure and the number in bold. We have the figure title in title case in italics, the image itself, and then text goes after that. Now, the steps, bold the figure label, make sure it's numbered sequentially, so the numbers should be going up one, two, three, etc. Make sure you italicize the figure title and capitalize in title case. The figure shouldn't have any extra horizontal lines, uh, so don't draw a box around it or something like that. And make sure you don't replicate the title in the figure itself. The title should be descriptive and it should be sufficiently detailed that in case someone is uh, accessing this with vision impairments, so their screen reader software will read the t title to them and it will make sense. It's not like car sales. Car sales growth is better, but car sales growth for the period 2010 to 2020, that tells them what they're missing. All right, now looking at this, let's go ahead and take a look at the APA style website here. So if we look at these sample figures here, you'll see that we have a variety of different options here. So let's go ahead and look at the first one here. So you can see that we've got figure one bolded. The title here in title case and italics. We have our graphic here. It's labeled so we can understand all the different data points. By the way, this different shading here, this means that if you print it out in black and white, you'll still be able to tell which is which, which is good. And then it has a note explaining some of the data, which comes sometimes. Now, what if it's something that's derived from another source? Well, that's where this next example comes in handy because it shows us, okay, we need to have note italicized and then from or adapted from as the case may be. 
uh, depending on how if you're just copying it or if you are changing it. In this case, we are changing it, so we'll use adapted from. You can see that the title of that source is given in quotation marks. We have the authors, the year, where it was published, the page number as applicable, uh, DOI, and uh, the copyright, you know, who holds this, which in this case is the publisher of the journal. So what will we do for this article here that we were looking at earlier? Well, let's take a look at uh, this here. So we've got the basic information and here. So let's take that here and let's start with that. And match destination formatting. All right, now if we look at the example on APA style, we see that, oh, it's giving the initials first. So let's do some rearranging. S period Smith, L period Cunningham Sabu, G period Ald, And we see, okay, before that, we need to have this, the title of the article. And it's going to end with a comma by, and then the list of the authors, and then the publication year enclosed in commas, then the title of the journal, and then there's no page information there. Uh, if there was a DOI, we would include it here, but here, because it keys the reference section, we don't need to include that URL. Now the question is, who has the copyright on the information that you're adapting? So let's take a look at that journal website. So if we're on the journal website here, we have some things we can peek around here. Uh, let's go ahead and let's take a look at the editor's note first and see if we can find some of the stuff about the journal policies and procedures. Now, that, that is sometimes uh, buried, but here we have, even before we look at the editor's note, we see, oh, hold on, contribution and reprint guidelines and reprint information. So let's take a look at that. Now, within these contributor and reprint guidelines, we will get some pieces of information about the journal itself. We want to know who claims ownership of the content, namely who has the copyright. So looking through these details here, uh, we're not seeing anything yet. All right, on to the next one, reprint information copyrighted. All right. Now it sounds like since they are uh, holding in the point of contact rather than referring to the author, it's very likely that they are the copyright holder. And it does say SNA, which is the name of the parent organization. SNA research. So if in doubt, you could always send them an email and ask, but in this case, the School Nutrition Association, SNA, a, appears to be the copyright hold, holder on things. Now, last thing to check, we'll just look at see if the article itself includes anything listing the, the copyright on this, and it doesn't. So we're gonna go with SNA for now, if in doubt, again, do make sure to check with the journal itself. So the copyright should be in the same year that it was published. Let me just double check that. School Nutrition Association. And there we have it. 
So this is a figure in APA style. Uh, let's go ahead and make sure it's flush left. We can even resize it here. And because it's generated from Excel, it will dynamically do that just by clicking and dragging. It's a great reason to use Excel for that. And we've made it uh, as wide as the column, make maximum use of the space. And if I look in this say, well, this is kind of hard to see. I need to make it taller. You can make it taller as well. You can even still go ahead and add data labels and other things if you so choose. All right, well, that's going to wrap things up here. So if you have any questions, feel free to send us an email at onlinewritingcenter.acu.edu, schedule an appointment, or visit us online. I'm always happy to work with students wherever you are in the process. Have a good day.